Praise the Lord. If you've got your Bibles with you, you want to turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm just going to read one verse, verse 19. Romans chapter 5 and verse 19. This is what the Word of God says. But just as, as though the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And God will bless his words was this evening. You know, I think it's very important that when we, we read through the Word of God that we actually understand that God actually made man in his own image and likeness. And that the Bible tells us that he fashioned man out of the dust of the earth and then he breathed into man's lifeless body the breath of life. In other words, God wasn't just filling Adam's lungs, you know, with fresh air or oxygen, but he was breathing into Adam his very life, his very nature. And so Adam became a living being, a spirited being, just like God. The Bible actually tells us that God is a spirit. So each of us are made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live within a body. So we're three-dimensional the way that God is in terms of him being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So God breathed his very life, his very nature, into Adam. And the moment the Bible tells us that Adam sinned, something within him died you see god had said to adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the moment that adam did that the bible tells us that he died because god had said to him in dying you will surely die so the very second that adam ate from the forbidden fruit a light went out within adam and he died spiritually first and that result of that spiritual death was that he died physically a period of time later. So Adam actually died twice. The book of Romans, Romans 5 and verse 12, actually makes it very clear that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. So God never intended for Adam to die. Adam was made to live in the presence of God forever. Adam had eternity within him just like you have eternity within you. So God made him to live forever. But because of Adam's disobedience to the Lord, every person that was born after Adam actually entered into Adam's sin. He inherited Adam's sin and Adam's old sin nature. The spiritual light from Adam had gone out. When again we read through the word of God, we find that not only did the light of God's presence within his life go out, but he actually moved in to the darkness, so to speak. In, in Psalm 104 and verse 2, the Bible refers to the Lord himself. It says he wraps himself in light as with a garment. A garment. So Adam was made in the image and likeness of God. So he would have a garment upon him that was light. It was almost like he wore a garment that reflected the light of God's presence. So that which he wore, simply because he was made in the image and likeness of God, was removed from both Adam and Eve, and they saw themselves naked the moment they sinned. And you should know as well as I do that the word naked doesn't just mean an absence of clothes. When the Bible talks about Adam and Eve being naked and they knew no shame, it's referring to an absence of clothes. But the Hebrew word referring to nakedness, when Adam and Eve suddenly saw they were naked, is actually referring to a loss of spiritual covering. So I'm saying tonight that the moment they sinned, the light of God's presence that arrayed them like a garment went out. And so they was naked before the living God. So both Adam and Eve lost the light of God's presence. They were now in darkness. How many of you heard the expression that people use today? And they say that people have kept me in the dark. And it simply means that they're not privy to certain information or they're not allowed to enter into certain things. And sin itself has kept people in the dark. They don't seem to understand the things of God. They don't seem to comprehend the things of God or move into his presence and the relationship that God wants for them to have. Because sin has darkened their understanding. In fact, the Bible tells us that Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the truth of the gospel, the glorious light of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's blinded them so they're in a dark state so they spiritually can't see. And this was the state that Adam and Eve were in. But God's whole purpose in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ 
was to cause people to come out of that darkness and to come into the light. So the Bible often refers to Jesus, you see, as being the light of the world. People will even call him the light of the world, particularly around this season that we're in right now. And Jesus really came as the light of the world to turn a hopeless situation around to restore, the Bible would make clear, all that was lost at the fall of man. So Jesus came to restore something that was taken away, to return it back to its original condition and its original state. And mankind was made in the original condition and state to know and to fellowship with God, to walk with God. And so God, through Jesus Christ, was looking to restore people back into a right relationship with him. So he's rightfully called the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And he will bring a light into any dark situation. He will bring his understanding into any dark situation you would have. When people say I've suddenly seen or the lights have gone on, they're referring to understanding something they never did before. And God wants people to understand that they were made for fellowship with him. That the condition they're living in now was never what God intended. Is a result that we're living in a fallen state in a fallen world. So Jesus Christ came to turn those spiritual lights back on in every person's life. And the only way those spiritual lights can be turned back on is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to acknowledge that you are in darkness and that you're in darkness because of sin. And to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of those sins, to cleanse you of those sins, and accept him as your Lord and your own personal saviour. And that in turn will lead you to surrender your life to him, all of it. And God wants people to surrender their life to him, not to live a life that's independent of God. We know we're living in times today where not just individuals live independent of God, but we see all nations living independent of God. And yet the word of God says righteousness exalts a nation. So if a nation is not living the way it ought to, and it's having troubles and difficulties and calamities and hardship, it's often an indicator that they're not exalting the Lord by living a righteous life before him, by living in accordance with God's word. Many have cast out the word of God today. Many are not living a life dependent on God, but are living a life independent of God, seeing God as irrelevant for their lives today. But yet God is absolutely relevant and he's the one that can make a difference in a person's life. He can make a difference in a nation if only the people of God would turn to him and ask him to move in power. So God wants to make a difference in the lives of individuals. He wants to make a difference in the lives of communities of people. And God's plan to give mankind a chance, an opportunity of coming back into friendship with him was to send his son born of a virgin. You see, God didn't have a plan B. God had one plan that he knew would be totally successful. And that's the difference, you know, with God and the governments of the world today. God's kingship, God's government is total successful. And if man would come under that government, they would live in peace. They would achieve things that they tried to achieve in the natural. They would achieve through him. And so God's plan was to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. His son would have no natural father, in other words. Joseph was not Jesus' natural father. Heavenly father furnished the blood of Joseph. So Adam's sin or Adam's sin nature would not be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus was simply born of Joseph, then he would have been contaminated with Adam's old sin nature. But father furnished the blood, furnished the blood in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus' bloodline was absolutely clean. There was no contamination within Jesus' bloodline. So no sin, no sin entered in to the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived that sinless life. Nothing came from Adam's line. It came from Heavenly Father's line. When you read through the book of Leviticus, I think it's Leviticus 17, will tell you that the life of the creature is in the blood. The life of Christ is in his blood. That's why his blood is power to wash away sin. So really when we come to the time like Christmas, we're seeing God's plan of redemption 
put in operation where we've seen it starting to work out and God's plan was to send his son so Jesus himself is often referred to in the Bible as the seed of woman notice he's never referred to as the seed of man because he's not the seed of man he's the seed of woman he's the seed of his heavenly father a pure bloodline because he had no natural father but his spiritual father his heavenly father furnished that bloodline so when you think about the life of the lord jesus christ when you think about his blood because there was no sin within his life therefore no sickness could enter the lord jesus christ so perhaps he was the only child that never had a vaccine perhaps he was the only child that never had colds and flus and influenzas never had the smallpox chicken pots any of these diseases because a disease could not live in the Lord Jesus Christ I would even go as far to say that because he lived a sinless life and his blood was pure there would have been no tooth decay absolutely healthy from word go because no sin was found within him in fact the Lord Jesus Christ said on one occasion that you know that Satan has nothing within me so he had no hold upon the Lord Jesus Christ, a complete clean bloodline. The life of the creature is in the blood. And the Bible said the blood makes atonement for your life. So the blood of Jesus Christ was pure for the fact that he was going to lay it down at one time as a pure offering before God. Think of the priestly worship before God. The high priest would go in to the presence of God. Other people were excluded from the presence of God. But God never wanted a curtain of exclusion. God wanted everybody to come in. But what tended to happen? The priest would go into the presence of God, but never without the shedding of blood. So blood would be shed for his own sin and for the sins of the nation of Israel. And the fact that he would go in and shed that blood, it was supposed to be pure blood, blood of an animal that was not defected. No one could bring a defected animal before God. It had to be the perfect offering. So you can see likewise our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the purpose of the becoming was to offer his own blood, a pure blood, as an offering for the sins of the nations, for the people of, of man, mankind upon the face of the earth. He's to offer that blood offering for us all. So Jesus Christ came. He had to be born of a virgin. There are many people today that dispute the virgin birth because it was a miraculous event. But the Bible tells us that the prophet Isaiah, 750 years prior to this, so the virgin will be with a child. So God foretold it for people to look into. And even though it seems impossible with man, it's not impossible with God. God was bringing his man into the earth because a man had lost what God had given him. And Adam, the first Adam, lost everything that God gave him through that one act of disobedience. But God's last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ was to purchase it all back. Now I want you to understand that Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. He's not referred to as the second Adam. Because if it was the second Adam, there could be a third Adam and a fourth Adam and a fifth Adam. He's basically saying he was the last Adam, showing us that his work was complete. God had given authority to man. Man had lost the authority. God's plan was, was that man's authority would be restored, but above all that, his relationship with God would be restored. And so, Father was looking to get his man into the earth. So part of the reason that the Father uh, sent the Lord Jesus Christ was because he made an agreement with the Son, that if the Son would uphold his law and live a complete sinless life, and then lay down that sinless life as a price or as a ransom for your sin then every man who ever committed a sin could find pardon forever in the presence of the father on the grounds of that agreement that's exactly what jesus christ did so there was a reason for the season there was a reason for him coming it wasn't just so that people can have christmas presents 
It wasn't so that people could, you know, have a nice turkey to eat and tinsel on the Christmas tree. It was so that mankind could be restored to the living God and not be at a distance for him forever. Jesus came as our Emmanuel, God with us, because he wanted relationship with us. He'd been separated us from the day that, that Adam and Eve left the garden. And God was looking for that intimacy. He was looking for that friendship. He was looking for that relationship again. And so he sent his son to restore that which was lost. You see, Jesus Christ didn't just come to save the lost. The Bible says he came to, to restore that which was lost. Everything that was lost at the fall of man. Jesus Christ came to restore on the grounds of that agreement that he had with his father. And people today need to understand that amazing truth. And in order to fulfill this, the Bible makes it clear that God had to find a woman, a woman that lived right before him, a woman that would carry that child and would believe him. And you know, Mary was that girl. And she was only a girl when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. And what was conceived within Mary's womb was the word of God, the pure word of God. She had no other evidence except the word that came from an angelic being. And she says, be unto me according to your word. In other words, she believed the word of God and wanted things to happen in her life exactly like the word of God said. And if we as believers today want to receive the promises of God, want to enter into all that God has for us, we have to receive the word just like Mary received the word. You see, people have problems when they mention Mary. Protestants have problems when they mention Mary because they find that other groups, other religious groups, have exalted her to a higher place than she really should be at. But really, Mary was the first New Testament believer. Mary really was the one that showed tremendous faith and the favour of God was upon her life. And when God favours you, it doesn't mean favour will look the way that you think it would look. Sometimes people think favour is just that everything's going to go well for you. But that is not what favour is where God is concerned. Mary had favour upon her life. The word of God tells us that. But her favour didn't look like favour, what other people would have. How would you feel as a young girl like in a Hebrew culture having to go and tell them that you were pregnant? Could you imagine the stigma? Could you imagine the gossip, the talking behind the back? Even Joseph himself never believed her initially. It took angelic intervention. It took a supernatural act of God to convince Joseph that what was within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That it wasn't a man that had done this to her. So the had to be supernatural happenings to cause Joseph and Mary to work together and to walk together to receive the child Jesus Christ. And what was conceived within Mary's womb was the pure word of God. And when the pure word of God is conceived in your heart, it is going to give birth. Mary had no other proof except the word of God. When the Lord told her through the angel that what would be conceived in her, you know, would be the word of God. She had no other evidence. She didn't look pregnant. She didn't feel pregnant. There was no morning sickness the next day. And she had no desire to eat peculiar foods. <laughs> she had none of those things. But she believed the word of God. And because she believed the word of God, eventually that word began to show and began to grow. And I'm saying to you tonight, if you would believe the word of God in this season, because this is the season where we celebrate the miraculous of God, God coming to the aid of mankind. And if you would receive that word within you, that word will start to grow within your life and eventually it will show. Because what was conceived in Mary act to produce and when you believe the word of God when it's conceived within you that word will always produce after its kind in Mary's case it was the child the Messiah but in your case that word could be a healing 
That word could be your provision. That word could be your family breakthrough. It could be anything that God is speaking to you on when you receive that word within you. So I'm saying that this young Hebrew girl had a tremendous faith in the living God. She trusted in him, nurtured that child when that child was good, was willing to go through all the embarrassments, all the talk, all the difficulties of society that she lived in would bring her way. Willing to go through the difficult journey to Bethlehem. Because Caesar Augustus issued a decree that people had to return to the place of their birth to register. So because it followed the, the fathers or the man's uh, lineage, they went to Bethlehem. And that journey was a difficult journey when you're heavy in labour. And that journey was designed to take the Christ out of her. To remove that word from within her. No other reason. Because that censor was never completed. Never completed. And when the enemy failed to remove the Christ child from within her. The word from within her. God miraculously brought that word to fruition. And the enemy will try to take the word of God out of you. Through difficult times, obstacles in your way, a difficult journey. But if you would hold on to the truth that God gives you, whether that word comes by an angel, whether that word comes through you just reading the word of God, whether it comes through a pastor or a friend, whether it comes through a dream or a vision, it doesn't really matter. The word of God is the word of God. Stop looking at the wrappers it's in. It's like people, if an angel appeared and shared a word, and I was to share the same word from the scripture, they would believe more the angel saying it than they would me sharing from scripture. But it's exactly the same word. It's just been wrapped up differently. And men today have lost sight of the true meaning of Christmas. Because it's been lost in all the celebration. But what really are they celebrating? They talk about the spirit of Christmas, but that's not the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's completely different. People are celebrating what? What are they really celebrating? To many, it's just a holiday, it's just a festival. And what the enemy has done is trying to take the word out of Christmas. So we're no longer at Christmas. You know, it's Xmas. Crimbo, people call it today. Rather than saying Christmas, because they tried to take the Christ out of it. And so many people celebrate, but what are they celebrating? You see, I believe we can only celebrate when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ in to our lives. When we know that our relationship is restored to him. And so we have today people that will celebrate. There'll be people that will be out buying presents, looking for that special something for the special person in their life. But God sent the special one to people like you and me, he considered to be special, so that your life could be full with his abundant life. You see, people can buy all sorts of things today. They can buy each other diamond rings, they can buy each other cars. Many people that have uh, the finances may buy other people houses, and they can buy extravagant even at Christmas time. But that person's life can still be empty because Jesus Christ is the true meaning of Christmas. And many are missing that out today. Even many believers celebrate Christmas more on a worldly level than they do on a godly level where they live in that Christ-like life. And God wants us to be people that recognise the whole purpose why Jesus Christ came was to restore us into relationship with him. That all could be saved on the grounds of what Jesus Christ did if they would believe in him, if they would open up their hearts, believe in their hearts and confess with their mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus is not just for Christmas. We see signs on the back of cars today it says a dog is not for Christmas, just for Christmas. But for many, Jesus is just a Christmas. They'll go to a midnight service, but never really embrace the one that has come to meet with them. Never really know that God is Emmanuel, 
that is God with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He wants to dwell within our heart forever and ever. You see, I believe one of the saddest days in God's life was when Adam and Eve, when he watched Adam and Eve uh, walk out of that garden. The only two human beings that ever lived in that garden. But yet God wants everyone to live within the garden of his presence. He wants every person to accept him. And so this Christmas is important to put Jesus first in every area of your life. Yes, you may see family, you may see friends. But the important thing is always to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ why you are celebrating this season, why you choose to celebrate it. Many people don't choose to celebrate it. Many people have angles about Christmas. But for myself, I choose to celebrate a time when God sent his only begotten son, begotten, not created, always with the Father, but he was willing to leave all the privileges, all the rights of his kingship in heaven and become a man. The one who could not be confined by the heavens because he's so vast, was willing to be confined for nine months within the womb of a young girl. He did all that so that you can have freedom in him. When we think of Jesus Christ, he truly was the last Adam. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came to lay down his life so that you might take it up. And so when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, Jesus hung upon that cross for three hours. He was cut off the Father's presence and he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that time, just like the first Adam, Jesus died. Jesus died spiritually upon the cross of Calvary. He who knew no sin became sin. And he was cut off the Father's presence so that even nature itself responded to that act. The skies became dark and Father turned his face away. Just like when Adam left the garden, when Adam spiritually died. Jesus Christ experienced that separation from Father in order that you may be accepted into his presence. What an exchange that was on the cross of Calvary. Jesus, for all eternity, had never known a day without Father's presence until that time on the cross of Calvary. And then at the end of that spiritual separation, Jesus gave up his ghost, the Bible tells us, for three more hours, he hung on that cross, he agonised and he died a physical death, just like Adam. He was the last Adam. But the great thing was, the story wasn't over. And you might be saying today, well, why are you speaking about the cross when we're supposed to be talking about Christmas? Because the cross overshadows the cradle. Because it was all about God's salvation plan. It was never about anything else. God had lived so long without you, he longed for you. I became a Christian when I was 23 years old. So I've been a Christian for over 40 years. And I became a Christian not because I feared going to hell, but because I realized what a great love he had for me and his love compelled him to die on a cross for me. And I thought if someone could love me that much, he deserves my life. He deserves my love in return. And so I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, not because I feared going to hell. There's people today you could talk to about hell and they will have no fear of hell. I gave my life to Jesus because he knew, I knew his love was absolutely amazing and extravagant love towards me. He loved me while I was a, still a sinner. He never took his eye off me. And he longed for me to be reconciled to him. And on that cross of Calvary was reaching out his hand towards me. And when that truth entered my heart, when the light came on, I embraced him and God started to clothe me in that righteous robe again. That robe that Adam lost that went out. The light came on 
and a new relationship with him. And that relationship's available for all of us listening to my voice today. But God will never force that relationship upon a person. Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. If anyone would open that door, he would come in and eat with them and they with him. In other words, he would strike that covenant agreement with them and he would be with them forever. He would change their world. He would introduce him to us and give them an amazing, glorious life. That all the promises that he has made would become yes and amen in their situation. He would turn their hopeless situations around. It's an amazing gift that he offers to mankind today. So God's gift at Christmas was the Lord Jesus Christ. And embracing the Lord Jesus Christ would lead you to a lifestyle that is far vast and greater than anything else you've experienced. And yet many people turn their faces away because the package of thinking, I need to give my life to Jesus, seems to be too great. Wise men came from the East. They didn't need, need no sat nav folks. They were supernaturally guided by the living God. Many people just look and say, well, he was guided by the star. God calls a star in heaven as a sign that they followed knowing that a king would be born. When they saw that sign in the, stars, in the sky and they began to follow, that was the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. 18 months later, they arrived, the Magi from the East. And the Magi were king makers. That's what they was known as. They wasn't just wise men. They were king makers. And they would have come with an entourage of people. They wouldn't have just been three of them. In fact, the Bible doesn't tell us they were three wise men. It says Magi from the East. All it shows is that they presented three gifts. Gold, frankincense and myrrh. And we need to understand those things. The mere is just humanity, a common use item. The frankincense was an offering to the gods and the gold was for kingship. And Jesus was all those things. He was a king, he was God, but he was a man. And they came to him, they traveled a vast amount of distance to reach the Lord Jesus Christ. When Pharisees are told about Jesus and told where the king would be born, the king of the Jews, it was six miles away in Bethlehem and they couldn't make the journey. And yet the wise men came from thousands of miles away. And it doesn't matter how far you are away from the Lord, you can encounter him today. It doesn't matter what you've done or how deep you think your sin runs, the blood of Jesus Christ runs deeper. There's no one outside the compass of his grace. His hand is not too short to save, and he will save people to the utmost today. All he wants them to do is willfully accept him. And if they would willfully accept him, he would willfully accept them and draw them into his kingdom and make an amazing difference within their life. And they would spend an eternity in his presence forever. And that beginning of enjoying the presence begins the moment you ask him into your life. We have to understand the true meaning of Christmas. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever should believe in him, cling to him, trust in him, should not perish but have everlasting life, his presence, living in his presence. And that's what God longed for. The greatest gift a person could give the Lord today would be to give them their heart, to just open up their heart and to allow him to come in afresh and anew. And if you're a believer today that have lost sight of the true meaning of Christmas, lost sight of the Lord, in all the calamities and all the problems that are going on in the world today, then God can restore everything that's been lost in your life because Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost 
he can restore it. Because you were created to know him, to live with him, and to fellowship with him. God didn't need to create you. God existed far long before you, you were created. But he wanted to share his goodness and his love with those that were made in his image and likeness. And that's you and me. Would you honour him this Christmas? Would you run in, would you not get lost in all the attractions and the bright lights? The only light that God wants you to see is the light of his presence. And God wants you to be a light for him today that other people can see. I don't believe that God delights in Christmas time today because I believe more sin is committed around this particular period of time. There's more drunkenness, more adultery, the office parties, there's more gluttony, overeating, over drinking, there's more abuse of children, there's more neglect, there's even figures that state there's more divorces at this time. So it's not a delightful time for the Lord. The only reason it becomes a delight to him when his people honour him <coughs> for who he truly is and for all that he has done. And when a person surrenders their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God isn't just out about filling your room full of presents around Christmas time. He wants you to receive a true gift that won't fade out away and no one can take from you. That true gift of eternal life that is found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not find eternal life by going to church because you just go in the church. You find eternal life in surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to say to you tonight, it is the best possible life you could ever experience. And for those that are listening to this message, would you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you surrender afresh in you? Would you give all your life, not 90%, not 99% of it, but 100% of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? And in return, he will give you 100% of his. What an exchange we have. Let's just pray right now. And you do need prayer tonight. We pray for you. And we know that God will touch your life because he's a miracle working God. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. Father, I just give you thanks and I give you praise tonight. I thank you, Father God, for the true meaning of Christmas, that Jesus Christ was coming to reconcile to himself, to buy back, with the price of his own blood, all that was lost. So Father, I thank you that really Christmas time was the unfolding or the beginnings of your plan. No wonder the angels was there to foresee that this plan had no real hiccups. And I give you all the glory that Father God, you don't have a plan B. It's one plan that is absolutely successful. And I pray that for each of us and for those listening tonight, that they would enter into the plan and the purpose that you have for their lives, that they would enter into the destiny that you have in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.